Ida Mae Stoll always knew she was different. Born with what she'd later call a twisted up leg, the coal miner's daughter used leg braces to, to get around her hometown of Sio, Ohio in her youth. Even when she was a grade schooler, the independent streak that would make her famous was already on full display. She refused to be shamed for her disability by her classmates or anyone else, and as she later told the Chicago Tribune, at just seven years old, Ida declared that she was finished with being disrespected at school. Ain't nobody gonna laugh at me. Newspaper reports disagree on exactly what age Stoll first entered the mines herself. Some say 12, others say 8, and after her legend had grown, a few even claimed a tender age of 6. Regardless of what the calendar said, it's a fact that she was only a little girl when she started following her father around underground to help dig coal. At first she was a helper, carrying her dad's lantern and pushing the coal cart ahead at his side. But as she got older and stronger, she became a formidable miner in her own right, regularly hauling out six or seven carts a day for her $2 daily wage. A teenage stall worked alliance alongside her husband in a small eastern Ohio country bank drift mine, an independent operation dug out of the Appalachian Hills by hand. By 1933, in her mid-30s, she had become part owner of a mine near Jewett, Ohio, a first for a woman in the mining business. Things were going pretty well for her and her family. The mortgage was paid, the kids were thriving, and Stoll was doing what she liked best, avoiding women's work around the house and digging coal. Photos of her, of her from that period show a, st a tall, statuesque woman with muscled forearms, a steely squint, and a determined set to her jaw. But in late January 1934, word kicked up about federal mine inspectors sniffing around Ida May's business. She saw a mortal threat to everything she had worked for over the past two decades. Stoll wasn't working alone in the mines anymore. Desperate for labor, operators had been forced by the Great Depression to, at least temporarily, suspend their prejudices and allow women underground to work alongside the men. Though Appalachian women like Stoll had been quietly working in family-owned mines for decades, Ohio state law forbade the weaker sex from engaging in a host of manual labor jobs, coal mining included. Stoll was both pioneer and outlaw, and she knew that the lawmen would find her eventually. When the day finally came in early February, her female co-workers hid while Stoll prepared to give their visitor a proper welcome. I knew he was coming to put me out, so I put some rotten eggs in my coal cart, she later explained. I started throwing and chased that inspector out of the mine to his car and covered the car besides. I really stunk him up. Ida May's valiant efforts notwithstanding, James Derry, chief of Ohio's Bureau of Mines, responded to her stunt with an order that she leave her job at once. Stoll appealed the order and took the fight to court, where the press dubbed her the Amazon of the coal pits and seemed to regard her with a mixture of derision and awe. Her stern, snappy one-liners during interviews helped solidify her reputation as a woman it was best not to cross. One choice soundbite. I could show that mine inspector a thing or two when it comes to muscle. Ultimately, Stoll's ownership stake proved to be the t determining factor, and she was allowed to return to work in 1935. Despite the headaches and the hassles, Stoll liked her job and was furious at the implication that her time would be better spent in the kitchen doing what she termed baby work. Moreover, she was good at it. A 1934 article marveled, any miner in the district will admit she's his equal physically, and Stoll herself took pride in her ability to outwork her male counterparts. She didn't mind the hard labor, the dirt, or the coal dust. To her, it was vastly preferable to a more traditional life indoors. Overalls, boots, and a miner's cap suit me better than silk, slipper, and a butterfly hat, she told one reporter. My face gets black, but I prefer coal dust to a powder puff, and I'd rather use a cross-cut saw than a golf club. That might sound unladylike, but every wo to every woman her own desires. Mine is digging coal. Stoll's mining career ended in 1944. Her husband died that year, and without her partner by her side, she found she'd lost her taste for coal. She spent the next 40 years in peaceful obscurity, caring for her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and scraping out a living on her farm in Sio. True to form, she prided herself on her self-sufficiency and ability to work well into her old age. In one of her last interviews, she made it plain that her fighting spirit had never faded. I still got my strength, she told the reporter. Ain't afraid of man or woman, and I can still find coal in these hills. Ida Mae Stoll died on April 23, 1980, at the age of 84. And that's Ida Mae.
Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Have a drink. All right. We're, this is a forgiving audience. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to do a little chat, if that's, yeah, if that's chat. all right. All right. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could tell our students where the title from the book came from. It's called Fight Like Hell. Um, yeah, that's a, I mean, I'm sure you all know Mother Jones, right? Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Yeah, and, and if you don't, you'll read about her in the book, but... Mother Jones, Mary Harris, was an Irish immigrant woman who became a really formidable labor organizer and agitator when she was in her 60s, 70s, maybe even 80s. Uh, she would show up on the picket lines dressed in you know, a black silk dress with a bonnet and a little lace dicky, and she would just rain hell upon the capitalists and the bosses. And one of her most famous quotes, um, mourn the dead, and or oh, what is it? Fucking, uh, yeah, mourn the de pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. And I thought that was a cool thing to call your book about labor agitators and rebels. And it's just, I mean, fight like hell. That's the only way we get anything done, right? <laughs> Great. I love it. Yeah, some of my students are here. We covered Mother Jones in class, um, and she was uh, pretty popular. Uh, Mother Jones actually in 1903 brought an army, in quotes, of child laborers from Philadelphia to New York, to Oyster Bay, to President Roosevelt's house, and he would not see them. Um, she wanted to protest, call attention to child labor, um, and he would not see them. And so we're working to get a plaque um, at Teddy Roosevelt's house to mark that. That's good. We got a plaque at City Hall in Philly, mm -hmm. and I think kids and, and other folks that came out and they, they did it, they marched from, uh, from Kensington in North Philly all the way up here. Yeah. And he wouldn't pay, he wouldn't meet with them, but then that did kickstart a lot of public support and attention and legislation around child labor. So they won. They just didn't, you know, the big man just didn't see fit to meet with them and stare them in the eye. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had a question about timing for you. So we, we had this really interesting conversation um, before you came about students here organizing. And I feel like there's people organizing everywhere, right? There's students organizing here, elsewhere, Starbucks, Amazon, I mean, you name it, right? Um, so um, there seems to be an interest in unions and workplace issues and labor history and, and books like this. Um, wh why do you think this is happening? I think, well, I think there are a bunch of different factors that we're in this moment that we are right now. I mean, we're still living through a pandemic that a couple of years ago was way worse it became very clear whose lives and whose labor was valued and whose wasn't. The idea of essential labor, we got to talk about that for a couple months. A couple people got raises, a couple people got, you know, pots and pans, pans backed out of the window, but that all went away and th those people still went to work. And I think there, there's been a shift in people's thinking just around what role work plays in their lives and what they're willing to put up with. And that's, I think that's one of the things that's fueling so much of this organizing. And the fact that we've seen a couple, some people take on these giants and win, right? That's a more recent thing, like we're seeing with Amazon and Staten Island and the Starbucks workers around the country. But it is just such an incredible thing to see folks who don't have that much power at all take on the most powerful men in the world and get one over on them. Like, there's nothing better than seeing, you know, a David and Goliath story where David wins, and we're a nation of Davids, and it's, I think it's probably inspiring for folks to see people that are just like them taking on these, you know, tech oligarch evil freaks and winning. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. I like the idea that we're, we're uh, a nation of, um, of Davids. There was just an article in the New York Times, I think it was today, about how many of the organ of the organizers at uh, Starbucks are college graduates, or, right? So even people um, who graduate college and are expecting something from their jobs are finding out that what they're getting is not what they expected. Um, I know you see this as a journalist too, right? I mean, it's, I, I can't imagine graduating right now and trying to figure out how to get a job that pays you enough, that pays you benefits, that treats you decent. That's like, <laughs> that's pretty rare. 
And I think that, I mean, and that's bullshit. Like, that's not how it should be. If you put in that work, you should be able to find a decent job. And I think the folks at Starbucks, being younger college students who are kind of taking that power back and deciding, like, okay, well, this isn't good enough. This isn't fair. We're going to change this because there's more of us than there are of them. And there's a lot of baristas in this country and a lot of other coffee shops. There, we had a couple of coffee shops in Philly go on strike last week because they're in the same boat. Like it's every kind of worker can be a union worker if they want to. There's no, you know, there, there's no reason why they shouldn't be. Right, right. Yeah, it's not, it's not magic. So I want, I, I, this is a kind of a thick book. Um, and that's not a criticism. It's a very, uh, what's the word? I, I found the word earlier. It's, uh, you know, you, the, the, the writing is very, it's almost, um, it really moves, right? It moves at a really good clip. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's fun to read. It really flows. Exhilarating. That's the word I was using. I was talking to my, my husband saying, it's, a, it's an exhilarating read. And the writing is bursting with energy. And I love the way you organize the chapters, right? So let me, let me just, I'll read you. Um, so it's not like, it, and on this date, this happened. And on this date, this happened. So we have. Yeah, that's boring. Yeah, we have the trailblazers, the garment workers, the mill workers, the revolutionaries, miners, harvesters, sex workers, disabled workers, prisoners. Um, and um, I was wondering. Because you, so it's organized by the kind of work that people did, or by the way the work that people do. Can you tell us a little bit about how you chose to do that? Because there's a big story, and you capture a lot of it really well here. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> I was kind of worried that people would pick it up and be like, "This doesn't make any sense at all," because <laughs> it made sense to me, but that doesn't mean that it translates. But I'm really glad it did. When I was sitting down and trying to put together an outline and figure out who I wanted to write about. There's, it's just such a massive subject. And like I said in the intro, there are a lot of people who have done really incredible work about it already. And I didn't want to try and retread their their steps. And I haven't, as the, in terms of what I cover as a journalist, I haven't covered that much about education or healthcare. And a lot of really great writers have. So I'm just like, yo, go read their books. I'm not going to pretend. But I know a lot about workers that have done, I guess, maybe you would call it blue collar work or physical work. A lot of the folks in this book like work with their hands and their bodies and get ground down as a result of that. And that's kind of the pl world I'm from. Like my dad works construction and my granddad was a steel worker, like very blue collar, rural, piney family. <laughs> and I think that's the first experience with work I ever had. And even though I'm a writer, it's, it's just kind of always been the back of my head, right? And I also I wanted to challenge this idea that blue collar workers uh, working class people in general look a certain way and are a certain way and so obviously the white guy in the hard hat he's there he's important we love him but there's a lot of other people doing that work that don't fit into that stereotype and I wanted to make very clear that they've been here too the whole time and are behind some of the most important victories and struggles and um, for the last the last three chapters uh, the disabled workers sex workers and incarcerated workers those are also groups that have, of workers that have been part of the labor movement since the very beginning and done incredibly important work, but aren't necessarily always pulled into the conversation when we're talking about labor. They're often kind of just siloed into their own specific areas. And I don't think that's right either. So I decided I have an opportunity to pull everyone together and show the intersections between these different movements. And hopefully I pulled it off. Yeah, so you just anticipated my next question. That's great. Because I was going to say, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book is how you blow up the idea that some people still carry in their heads, which is that the labor movement is about and for white dudes in factories or on job sites with hard hats. So I'm just going to read off to you some of the working people that you will meet in this book. Uh, indigenous, uh, Chicano, and women miners, some of whom uh, were forced, some of the women uh, and, and men were forced uh, to work in or near the mines uh, because they were enslaved. Black uh, wobbly organizers, incarcerated workers, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Hawaiian agricultural workers, Yemeni agricultural workers, I had no idea, Yemeni auto workers, sideshow workers, male flight attendants, trans truckers, 
and gay steel workers. I mean, there's just, it, it, it's really um, a lot of fun to meet all these different people. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, why is it so important? I mean, I understand why you wanted to do this, but why do you think it's important in the world that we expand our vision of who and what labor history is about? Well, if we don't know who all is involved, how can we fight for everyone? You know, and also something that's really important with this that I want to do in this book is show people that are interested in organizing now that not only is there a place for you, like you've been here the whole time. There have always been people just like you doing this work and doing this organizing. Even if it feels like you look at Fox News and you just see a bunch of coal miners standing behind Donald Trump, like they're there. They're part of the movement. It's um, not a monolith, but so are so is Baird Rustin, like the queer black man who orchestrated the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Uh, Lucy Parsons, a black revolutionary who helped lead the first May Day parade in Chicago in 1886. Like Marsha P. Johnson is a labor icon. She was a sex worker who used mutual aid and built up resources and helped other queer and trans sex workers while she was also doing her work in you know, the queer and trans liberation space. Like Every kind of person has been involved in the labor movement, and I wanted to make it clear like it has never just been one type of person, one type of job, one type of union. Like it's this whole kaleidoscopic effort and everyone's contributions matter and everyone's contributions are the reason why we're here now. Like the the white guys in the hard hat, they're important, they raise me, God bless them, but they didn't do nearly as much as everyone else. And, or as everyone else thinks they did, too. That's right? the thing. I got a question last night at the little book launch in, uh, in Brooklyn. This guy, who is very well-meaning, but he, he's very sure of himself, he's like, well, so since blue-collar work, like, we know that union workers are mostly blue-collar, and they're mostly vote conservative, and it's mostly, you know, like, construction workers and whatnot. And I was like, well, we don't know that, because, like, literally the most common type of union worker in America is a black woman who works in healthcare or in domestic work. Like, you're... I don't know what outdated books you're reading, but it clearly wasn't mine. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, well, so the story of, of uh, working people in the U.S., U.S. labor history, is really rich with drama. I mean, there are amazing heroes. There are awful villains. There are extraordinary triumphs. There are heartbreaking tragedies and defeats. There's solidarity, rivalry, terrible violence. Do you have a favorite character? Is there anybody who you thought this? I mean, I know I do, but I, I'll, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. Is there somebody who you say, I love this person? Man, I would. I mean, they're they're all my favorites. They're all my children, right? But <laughs> Lucy Parsons is always my favorite to dig into and to mention. She was such a fascinating and complex person. And in writing this book, I actually was really lucky to have time to dig in a little bit deeper into her story because I thought I knew what her deal was and it turns out I was not really right. Um, a scholar named Jacqueline Jones wrote a really great book called uh, Goddess of Anarchy that was a really well-researched in-depth biography of Lucy Parsons and it, it kind of contradicted a lot of what we thought we knew and a lot of what Lucy Parsons wanted us to think because she was a woman, she's a black woman who was born on a plantation and she was born enslaved, and then after emancipation, moved to Texas with her family, and, and from there moved to Chicago, and that's when her story kind of really kicked into gear, and she was involved in labor organizing, she was an anarchist speaker and orator, she was more dangerous than a thousand rioters, as the Chicago police said, but she also pretended, the, the vision of herself she presented to the world was different from who she was, she didn't acknowledge the fact that she was black, she said that she was a Spanish indigenous maiden because I guess she was a little ethnically ambiguous you might say and she just decided that she didn't want to present herself that way and she didn't really focus on the struggles of black workers or workers of color she focused on white factory workers she was more like that class reductionist kind of Marxist position where she was interested in that not so much these more complex issues so she was like she was a there's a lot going on and I tried to condense it into this book and would encourage you to look more deeper into her because she's fascinating and it just kind of shows that you can be this, this incredible revolutionary this militant organizer and still have some skeletons in your closet and still let some people down like cause it just shows that labor leaders and like these these big sweeping bombastic heroes like they're still people and people are complicated and there, there's a couple things about her biography that broke my heart but 
I still kind of have to love her, you know, it's, we're complicated beings, and I was glad I got to show a little bit of the human side to someone I'd always thought of as just like this, like, charging martyr for the cause. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We we expect our heroes to be perfect, and they're people. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So was there anything that you were, you know, when you were doing the research and you thought, and you just were either struck really positively by something that happened or something where you thought, oh, man, this is awful? I can, I can tell you, I'll tell you both. I'll tell you about the one that broke my heart because you mentioned him sort of earlier on. Uh, this Yemeni immigrant named Nagi Daifula. I'm probably butchering the, the name, but I'm trying. Nagi Daifula, he was 24 years old. He moved here and be, he became involved with the United Farm Workers. And he served as a translator and he was an organizer and he was super involved with the Salad Bowl strike, which had happened um, right after the big boycott in the 60s. And one day, he and some of the striking workers were like hanging out around the convenience store. Perfectly legal thing to do. And the cops came up, started hassling them, and he stood up for them, told them to leave them alone, and they responded by bashing in his skull and dragging him across the concrete and leaving him for dead. And that broke my heart. And it, um, there's a lot more about it in the book, but just hearing stories like that of like someone who literally gave everything but didn't have a choice, but still, like the last thing he did was stand up for vulnerable workers. And I feel like we more people need to know about him because there are a lot of people like that that don't have, you know, the there's no Nagi Daifula Day in California, but there should be. But um, then on the flip side, something that I really loved learning about that was gave me like a warm, fuzzy feeling was in the, the chapter on disabled workers that explores the intersections between disability rights movement and labor movement. Because there's a lot there. Like, I didn't even know that going into it. I just kind of like crossed my fingers and started reading. But... um during the Section 504 occupation, which is, I don't know if you guys knew this, but like the longest in U.S. history, like occupation of a federal building was led by disabled activists in San Francisco in, uh, what was it, like in the 70s? Yeah, somewhere in the 70s. And <laughs> they were trying to get the government to enforce this law they'd passed that was like basically the first major legislation uh, for disabled people. They, they saw it as like a civil rights bill for civil, for disabled people and the government was dragging its heels and so they're like okay well we're gonna take over some of your buildings until you listen to us and they made in san francisco they made it 26 days before and they ultimately won i'll, I'll spoil the ending but they kept they're able to keep that going because they had so much community support from other organizations the black panthers are the reason they're able to eat they kept them fed because some of the activists inside the building the disabled activists were black panthers there's a big connection there and also uh at one point when some of the leaders went to dc to talk to congress they this was before the ada like there was not accessible public transportation for anybody and a lot of the activists used mobility aids and wheelchairs so the Mashness Union, they showed up with a truck, like a box truck, flatbed truck, and some rope. We're like, okay, we're going to figure this out. We're going to get you where you need to go. It might not be comfortable, but we'll, we'll get you there. And just seeing that kind of like real material solidarity between these two movements and just seeing the way they're interconnected, just the idea of showing up with a truck and be like, okay, you're in a wheelchair. You got somewhere to go. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I think that, that was one of the nice ones. That one, I was, I was stoked on that. I could see that. I could see how. I'm going to open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, we have some visitors. We have a lot of students. We'll try to give priority to the students, but everyone is welcome. And I, I will ask you, I promised that I would, please use the microphone uh, so that um, you can be heard. Uh, this is recorded So for people who couldn't make it tonight. So if you have a question, um, I know sometimes it's a little awkward, but uh, come up to the microphone so that you will be heard, not just by the people in this room, but by anybody who listens. Um, so, um, Black, come on up. Um, hi, I'm Ben. I'm a first-year political science student at Hasra, obviously. Um, I was curious, in your opinion, um, in a perfect world, 
how would uh, businesses function? Like, what would the uh, social hierarchy, in your opinion, uh, be to suffice for uh, a perfect, um, perfectly run business? Well, if I was in charge, well, if I was in charge, nobody would be in charge because I'm not really a big fan of hierarchy. But, I mean, the workers should own the business. It should be worker owned. Like, it, the, you know, uh, there's a phrase, uh, uh, that I'm forgetting that's uh, much more pithy than what I'm going to say. But yeah, like, I mean, the people that create the profit should be in charge of it. And sh the people that are doing the work should be able to direct how that works. I don't think anybody should be in charge of anybody. And I think that's kind of the reason we're in the situation we're in, right? Like, capitalism is a no-go. We need to get rid of that. We need to go get to direct worker control. And I don't know if we'll achieve that in my lifetime, but you love to see it when there are cooperatives and volunteer-led efforts out there. Like, we, money isn't everything. Uh, thank you. Come on up. We just had a, an, an event uh, earlier this week on worker-owned cooperatives. Um, yeah, yeah. Come on up. Hi, my name's Elias. Um, Speak into the mic. Okay. Hi, my name's Elias. Oh, God. Um... My question is, what was your most fulfilling part of the research that, like, you did in the in the book? Like, what was your, like, favorite, like, part of researching? The chapter that took me the longest is also my favorite, the, the prisoner's chapter, because I knew, I knew a decent amount about, like, modern prisoner organizing situations because of the industrial workers of the world and everything that's kind of happened post-2014. But I had no idea that there was such a huge amount of, um, like, prisoners' unions and labor organizing happening in the 70s. It kind of dovetailed with, like, the Black Power Movement, the Chicano Power Movement, with um, the Prisoners' Rights Movement. There was all these different things happening. And there were prisoners in different facilities who were able to organize, like, straight-up labor unions that were, like, affiliated with, with unions outside. Like, it was, it, there was a lot going on there. And the reason that that stopped is because the Supreme Court rolled out this decision in 1977, Jones versus the North Carolina Prisoners Labor Union, that essentially, like, set in stone, they denied the right for incarcerated workers to join a union. They said, like, we yeah, we hear you, like, First Amendment, whatever, but you're we're not going to give it to you. We're going to make it harder for you to organize because we we have biases against you. We think you're too dangerous. We think you don't deserve it. So there was a moment in time where there was like a full-fledged labor organizing movement within prisons in the U.S. and the government came in and was like, oh no, we can't be doing that. And that was really interesting because there's this kind of big gap in my research when I first started reading about it. There was like the 70s, a lot going on, and then 2014 onwards, a lot going on. Like what was happening in the middle? Oh, <laughs> a lot of repression <laughs> is what was happening. So yeah, that was fun Fun as a, as a, maybe not the right word, very interesting to read about that and learn more. Thank you. Good questions. Anyone else? Another question? Yeah? Hey, my name's Ani. Um, I'm with Long Island Jobs of Justice. We're really happy to co-sponsor tonight's event um, with Hofstra and the Labor Studies Program. Um, I just want to say that I think that one of the things that you're doing right now is probably one of the most radical things to do, which is exposing a history that has been, I don't even want to say forgotten. Um, it's been forced forgotten um, intentionally. And so um, I, I would say there's probably reason as to why we don't hear about these histories on a daily basis. Um, even within the labor movement, we don't hear about it. Um, and so I would say that even the labor movement as a whole could really benefit from access to the information that you have in this book. But um, so my question, uh, two, two part question. One is what would you say the reasons are as to why these stories have been forgotten and what's so dangerous about knowing about them. Um, and also, what are one or two lessons, um, I guess, that lessons learned from the organizing that these folks have done that could be passed down to the organizing that's happening today? Okay, two big questions. Um, well, the reason that, and when I say they, I mean like the bosses, the capitalists, the people in charge, 
of course they don't want us to know about these histories because they don't want us to know how powerful we are I mean there was a concerted effort for in for example in West Virginia where we had the Battle of Blair Mountain the largest armed uprising in US history there was a concerted effort among um, like coal connected businessmen and people who were involved in education to keep that out of the schools so the kids wouldn't know anything about that they wouldn't know about the mine wars they wouldn't know about this militant radical history that had happened right there on the ground they were growing up on because that made it more complicated for the coal bosses it made it more complicated politically but that's just the fact that you can grow up not knowing about this massive battle between labor and capital that happened just down the street like only in America but (laughs) It's and, the, and there's a lot in labor history in the U.S. that is pretty gnarly, like kind of embarrassing. Like labor, the organized labor has not always sent its best or done its best. You know, back in 1882, when the Chinese Exclusion Act was enacted, like this horribly racist, xenophobic law that excluded Chinese immigrants from this country for a long time, the American Federation of Labor was all for it because they didn't want a new wave of immigrants to come in and take their members' jobs. And that probably sounds pretty familiar, thinking about how we've seen that happen over and over and over in the history of this country. So it's like, it's not pretty, but it happened. We have to grapple with that past and use that to inform the way that we go forward. And I think I got your second question, uh, what we can learn from the good stuff, right? There's a story in the book about the 1946 sugar strike in Hawaii. And that is one of my favorite examples to talk about because that has so many parallels with what we are seeing today, uh, specifically the Amazon Labor Union. So 1946, most of the pl- most if not all, no, all, of the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii on the islands were owned by white dudes on the mainland. And they were worked by native Hawaiians and Filipino and Chinese and Korean and Japanese and European, like a whole mishmash of immigrants. And these workers were treated differently. They were paid differently. They were kept in different types of housing. Like there was like the Chinese camp and the Korean camp and the Filipino camp because the bosses didn't want them to talk to another. They didn't want them to organize. They definitely didn't want them to unionize. And they managed to do that anyway. (laughs) But it, it took a lot of doing and there was still like divisions between the different workers because they had been led to believe that there should be divisions there. But in 1946, when it came time to strike, their union, the ILWU, International Long, uh, Long Short Warehouse Workers Union, they they realized like, okay, what we need to do is bring everyone together and get past these divisions and bridge these gaps and really build like a strong strike. And they did that by bringing in translators, by building strike kitchens, by getting the workers to cook for one another and engage socially, and really uh, started to understand that they had so much more in common than they had that divided them. And they built a really strong community there, really strong bonds. And those bonds didn't break throughout the strike, even when the bosses tried to pit the workers against one another. And they won. And that was a really big deal. Because taking on big sugar in Hawaii in the 1940s was like taking on big tech now. And just see the, the, the lesson there being that, you know, building genuine community relationships and you know, doing multiracial, multilingual, multigender, multigenerational organizing and seeing that as a strength instead of a division or a weakness, like, that's how you get shit done. That's how the Amazon Labor Union got things done in, in Staten Island, by, like, reaching people where they are and understanding their culture and bringing people in instead of pushing them out or acting like they knew everything. And that's, I mean, that's the best lesson you can take, right? Like, we're stronger together. And even our differences can be strengths if we figure out a way to get past whatever artificial divisions we've been told exist. Great. Good, good. Um, Ronnie's terrific. Uh, he's the ED of Jobs with Justice. Anyone else? A question or a comment? Um, yeah, come on up. Hi, the name is Don Vanellis. Um, recently, I've gotten into um, doing writing commissions. Hit me up if you like. But um, in all seriousness, I guess 
how would you be able to take that fight like hell mentality to more freelance work as well? Because I've been burned in the past and I don't want to get burned again. Oh, dude, I'm a freelancer, so I hear you. <laughs> like I've been freelance for uh, a long time. And it's, yeah, it is hard. And people don't necessarily understand how difficult it is to be in that type of work, to be an independent contractor, to be subject to pitching and, you know, temperamental editors and all the things you have to put up with. Um, but there are, people are trying to organize something there. I don't know if you've heard about, um, the IWW has a free, the Freelance Journalist Union. That's something you can become involved in. And there's also a project under the National Writers Union called the Freelance Solidarity Project. And there are, yeah, there are a lot of really great writers who are in exactly the same position we are that realize, like, okay, this isn't sustainable. This industry pits us against one another. It's way too cutthroat. There's not enough outlets. There's not enough jobs. There's not enough editors that answer the emails. We have to organize. And because, like, as a freelancer, we're not, we can't join a union, you know, you know join a union thanks to the NRA. Shout out to 1935. But there are ways that we can work together and support one another. Also, study hall, which is kind of this, um, like, worker community. Like, that's been really helpful, too. There's a, lot, there's a good community there, a lot of, like, resource sharing. I would recommend you check them out, too, because that's where, I mean, that helps me out a lot, and I've been doing this for a minute. Okay. Thank you. This is very helpful. Did you have a question? Yeah. Come on up. Hi. Um, I actually have a question about uh, Staten Island. Um, I, I'm sure, as you already know, um, when I was reading up on it, I remember the line from one of the people that voted yes for the union. They said, like, um, that the organizers made organizing fun, which I feel like is a totally underrated way of looking at it. Um, and from, like, my understanding, it seemed like the organizers were sort of, like, both inside of the Amazon, actually working at the firm, at the warehouse, and then also outside of it as well. Um, like, what do you think about, like, organizers that are maybe not necessarily internal trying to organize? And do you think, like, that's a possibility? Like, people could be organizers necessarily without, you know, really being, like, an, in, like, a staple union trade? So, like, salting? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> very Does, Do you all, do all the, <laughs> the students know what salting is? Is anybody who doesn't know what salting is? Do you want to explain? Sure, yeah, just, yeah, it's, um... It's pretty sick. It's a, it's a tactic where it, um, someone who is interested in unionizing a certain place will get a job there and start talking to their coworkers and kind of getting the idea going, like, hey, maybe we should unionize. Like, it, like you saw Sorry to Bother You. Um, that one dude, he, what? It's a good movie. But that one dude was assault. Someone who gets a job there with the express aim of organizing people. And I think that's a great, I mean, if you can do it, do it. And it doesn't have to just be, like, a construction job site. Like, you can get a job at Starbucks and start talking to people. There's already momentum going. You can get a job at Amazon and talk to people. That's a perfectly valid way to organize. And honestly, like, it's pretty smart because that's one of the things, like you said, one of the reasons that they were able to win in Staten Island because the workers were just talking to one another. They weren't seeing, you know, Chris Smalls, Derek Palmer, Angelica as, like, outside organizers or anything or, like, union people. It was just you know, Chris and Derek, like, it was just their co-workers, and so, of course, it's easier to build trust and build relationships there. I mean, I spent a really long time covering the first Amazon union effort in Alabama and Bessemer, and one of the many, many, many union-busting tricks that Amazon used was um, doing something called third-partying, where they basically acted and told workers that, that, you know, oh, this union is coming down from New York, like, they don't know anything about you, they just want to take your money so they can buy cars and you know, make things worse for you. You shouldn't trust them. And obviously, also, that's bullshit. But that is, for someone who is hearing that and doesn't know that much about unions, wants to keep, hold on to a steady job. Like, that is a, a fear tactic that can be useful. And that in that case, like, it did have an impact. They couldn't do that at Amazon in Staten Island. Because, again, that's when it's just a couple co-workers talking to each other, it doesn't feel as scary or maybe as dangerous or risky as, talk, as like, sitting down with a union organizer and like strategizing I mean, making things fun making people feel safe and protected and heard like that's how you organize like there's a lot of different I'm not I'm, I don't, I'm not gonna pretend to be a professional organizer or anything right but that is one thing I've learned just through talking to a lot of people who are and a lot of people who have been organized like listening 
and being empathetic and letting people tell you what they need and then following their lead, that's how you get things done. Great. Does anyone else have a question before we um, before we head over to the signing? Yep. Hey, I'm you. Travis. Uh, I'm a New York City teacher, so I'm a guest here. Uh, thanks for letting other people come too. Um, so my question was, um, when you were going through your research, did you see also examples of the um, conflict, not just the heroes and villains, like uh, workers versus bosses, but also sometimes the structures of unions themselves and the lack of democracy that sometimes mm -hmm. comes, especially with larger unions. Um, I can't help but think of the UAW with recent reform wins, um, the Teamsters, now that TDU um, actually has finally gotten a candidate um, as president that's actually friendly to them. And personally, as a UFT member that's running against uh, Michael Mulgrew, uh, as part of the United for Change slate, um, I see myself as also one of those many people who are um, standing up to a larger union head that doesn't necessarily always take um, all workers' concerns in mind. Thanks. Mm, I love that. I did something similar like to that in my union. <laughs> also kind of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I didn't get that into internal union politics so much in the book, but that does make me think about Jock Yablonsky, Jock Yablonsky. terrible um, this name I'm sorry to this, this man's ghost but it, that was in the, the United Mine Workers it was uh, during a point where Tony Boyle this fucking guy Tony Boyle super corrupt like just an awful man who was screwing over um, well there's two things here but the one that I know more about so this guy Tony Boyle sucked he was in charge of the UAW, and he had been doing, like, skimming off the top, doing some, like, fancy financial footwork, and he had drained this benefits fund for minors who were disabled by black lung, and he had totally ignored their protests and requests to meet, and basically just kind of left them to die until, and I think it was 1967, a uh, man named Robert Payne, who was a disabled black coal miner, started this group called the Disabled Coal Miners and Widows of Southern West Virginia. And they started going out on strike, on wildcat strikes, and a protest. He got arrested. Like, he forced union leadership to listen to them, and it caused a whole... I mean, there's more in the book, but it caused a whole thing. And it was a really important piece of activism on their part, and it also went to show that, like, not all union presidents are on your side. And it's always important to hold their feet to the fire and get them out of there when you can because, you know, power corrupts. And that's something that we have to keep in mind even as we're part of the labor movement, as we're all trying to make it better. Maybe not everyone is always on the same uh, the same team in some ways. So it's great when younger, more progressive people show up or are like, cool, thank you for what you did. Here's how we can do it a little bit better. Awesome. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. So um, I would like my book signed, and I know that there are books in the back, and I don't know if people have brought or uh, plan to purchase, but um, how would you, um, we have someone from the bookstore, I mean, is there anyone else who has a question or a comment before we, oh, okay, Fran, and then we'll, if you, then we'll just head to the back. I'm Fran Abnett. I'm a union rep with Local 153 OPIU. I, we represent the clerical workers on campus. And one of, the, uh, my, one of the observations that I have is whether you're talking about past labor history or even more current history with the pandemic, is the absence of the clerical worker's voice. So why do you think that is? Interesting. Well... I suppose maybe not as many people know about what y'all are up to. I guess it's the kind of labor that, since you're tucked away in an office, right, it's not as in your face. It's not someone who's working in the street or working in a kitchen. People don't know how hard you work to keep things going. Like, folks in the administrative field, like, you're the reason anything gets done. But since it's kind of tucked away, maybe it's harder for people to understand how much work you're putting in. Yeah, and it's interesting when you talk about invisible, just before the talk, Professor Transiski, excuse me if I pronounce your name wrong. Everybody asked, does. You know, <laughs> do you know anyone who is in a labor union? And I guess there's different varieties of knowing, but everybody here who attends Hofstra should have raised their hand and said yes, because every department secretary, 
every, but practically every clerical worker in a missions office, financial aid, is a member of my union. Your teachers, your professors are a member of your union, right? The janitorial staff, oh, this is a highly unionized place. I think the only people who are not unionized are the, the, um, the so-called admins, the directors and the deans. So yeah, I don't know why people here don't realize as consumers that you, you do learn in a unionized workplace. And I'm so glad you brought that up because now at least a couple dozen people know that. And hopefully they'll, you know, people will think about that more because I think there's this idea of what a union worker is and the, the idea of what a union worker looks like. And it doesn't, in, in this, this broad stroke stereotype, like it doesn't look like you, it doesn't look like me, it looks like my dad. But it really, a union worker looks like all of us. And that's something we need to remember too. Fran, you got me thinking too, maybe we can work on this somehow making the, the, you know, the fact that this is a union campus, that you know lots of union people. If you say hello to your department secretary, you're saying hello to a union member or your professors. You're saying hello to a union member. Um, so we should, maybe that, that's something we could work on, right? Um, I like that. I like that. I think even public safety is all part of union. Yeah, I think everybody is except upper admin. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you, Kim. And we have some books for sale in the back. If you have a book and you brought it, I'm sure. Uh, that Kim would be happy to sign it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>